Um, my name is Aaron Gillick, uh, and I was asked to give a quick introduction to kind of energy use in homes and buildings. Uh, so my role is that I'm an associate professor at London South Bank University and the director of this uh, net zero uh, building center. Um, I'm sort of coming to this as, a, as an engineer. Most of my, my research has been in the area of sort of where, where technical ideas meet practical implementation. And so from that sort of lens, I'm very, very keen uh, on this whole process that you're all involved in. I think this is really interesting and really important. Uh, this role of sort of a citizen's journey and the potential that you had to sort of give really practical and impactful feedback to the council to sort of drive real change. So I'm, uh, again, a big privilege and, uh, and then thank you for, for inviting me to do this. So I'll try to keep it quick. Um, what I thought I would do is sort of open with a bit of context around where the UK emissions sort of come from in the built environment. So you might have seen this a bit from other speakers, but just to kind of quickly sum up. So, um, this circle, this pie chart, represents all UK emissions. The built environment, kind of residential, commercial, public buildings, they represent about a quarter of UK emissions. And then, you know, transport, uh, industry, everything else is in that sort of other three quarters. So it's a pretty sizable chunk um, of, of, of the UK's uh, carbon emissions that need to be kind of addressed. And if you were to kind of break down that slice into a sort of a bit more detail, like where does it actually come from? It's depending on the kind of building, and even within one particular kind of building, it varies quite a bit depending on the age of the building and all that. But as a broad sort of theme, this pie chart sort of sets the, the, the sort of simple story that it's all about heating, of, uh, of, of heating and hot water. So, so spacing and hot water heating is it, it, the vast majority of it, like well over two thirds uh, for homes. It's a bit less for commercial buildings. And again, this varies depending on the age of the building, but effectively anything that uses electricity, uh, so plug loads, lighting, fans, every other kind of appliance, those are a smaller piece of the problem these days because the grid is actually getting quite clean relative to you know, fossil fuels. And almost all of our heating, space heating and hot water heating in the UK comes from fossil fuels, so like vast, vast majority, 80 to 90%. So most of our emissions therefore come from that as well. And that's kind of the big thing to be focusing on in, in, in building. Um, so to talk about that, uh, there's this exercise we do with our students, which I find kind of fun. Um, we would normally take you know, a few hours and sort of workshop our way through this, but it's a fun idea. You basically take, take a building and imagine your goal is to design the least sustainable version possible. Like see, try, see if you could make the worst decision, the worst design decision from a sustainability point of view every single time. Um, and so we would go through this for a couple hours and, uh, and, and sort of see what students could come up with, right? Um, so I'll kind of run through what some of my answers would be if I were doing that. Well, what is the most unsustainable building you could possibly have? So the, the first thing would be to start with very carbon intensive building materials, right? So, so things that are very sort of uh, heavy weight, they consume and produce carbon in their manufacturing, things like concrete, brick, steel, things that are very hard to recycle at the end of use. So basically they, they cost a lot of carbon to create and then you have to throw them away at the end of the building process. That would be the least sustainable way to construct a building. Uh, then once you have your building materials, you would want to, again, if your objective was to make it the least sustainable building, make sure that you waste as much heat as possible, right? Uh, you would wanna have no insulation at all, just build a brick wall with a bit of, uh, plaster, maybe some paint on the inside, and that's it, right? No insulation, very, very uh, leaky fabric, and lots of air leakage as well. So lots of gaps everywhere, leakage around windows and cracks and all that. Um, so no regard for sealing up the building, just waste as much heat as you can. That would be the least sustainable thing you can do. Um, once you've got this high heat demand, you would want to try to provide that with the dirtiest fuel that you possibly could. Again, if your goal was to make the least sustainable building out there. Um, so you might think about fossil fuel electricity, right? We do use fossil fuels to generate electricity, but this is actually harder than it sounds to be really, uh, to, to be really dirty with this because the grid is surprisingly clean. So the grid, we, we've actually started to phase out coal quite a bit over the last couple of decades. Uh, we've got a whole lot more renewables coming online. So the grid is actually surprisingly efficient in carbon terms, right? 
Um, so if we were, again, trying to design the least efficient thing possible, what we'd want to do is have a completely different source of energy, just use fossil fuel heating to heat our home. Okay, separate that completely from the electricity system um, and use a completely different vector. Let's, 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 again, we're wasting as much heat as possible, and then we're not providing that heat with a clean electricity source, we're providing it with a dirty fossil fuel heating source. Um, which also, because it's separated completely from the grid, this gas heating source will always be dirty. There's no way to improve that at the point of use in your house, right? As we replace more and more of the grid with clean renewables, that doesn't help your gas boiler, right? So this would be, again, if your objective was to make it as inefficient as possible, this would be the way to do it. Uh, and then we could waste even more energy by sort of making clumsy controls and sort of a lack of comfort. I don't know if your house is like this, but I put different colors in all the windows here. Every room in my house has a different temperature because the heat loss is just so different. It's almost impossible to make the whole house comfortable at the same time. So you end up making some rooms uh, hotter than you want to, some rooms colder than you want to. Uh, and there are a lot of sort of really serious knock-on effects for this across the UK for, for sort of uh, unhealthy buildings. Uh, and then just to put a cherry on top, we should, if we're trying to make this as inefficient as possible, we should design a system that makes it really hard to fix. So we have different supply chains for every one of these little components, uh, make it very, very hard to sort of track and monitor what's going on in the building and very hard to improve uh, the building over time. So that would be, I think, a pretty good summary of what most students would come up with for the least efficient building you could, you could uh, come up with. Um, and now it's probably not surprising to say that this actually describes nearly 100% of the UK building stock in a lot of ways, right? Um, we're getting a bit better, right? And some homes certainly are more comfortable than others. Um, but by and large, we still use uh, very uh, high, high embodied carbon building materials that are not easily recycled. The buildings overall use about two to five times as much energy as they're gonna need to. Uh, so they are extremely leaky. We have insulated a lot, but not nearly enough. So, so by, by no means have we uh, insulated homes to any kind of reasonable standard. And yes, th this issue of supply chains, that everything is hard to fix, it's very difficult to go out and sort of change your home to make it more energy efficient. It, it's, it's very difficult to, to, to get reliable advice and have a quality assurance process along the way. So nearly 100% of existing buildings are described this way. But what is surprising and really disappointing is, in my opinion, nearly 100% of new buildings are also like this. You ask anybody who's building buildings these days, they would might they might sort of challenge that new buildings are definitely better they're definitely getting better but there is almost zero zero percent of uk buildings that are, exist today that are ready for 2050 that won't require some kind of retrofit to get them fit for purpose that will kind of reduce the heat loss and uh, get rid of the gas boilers and all of that so it, it's, it's quite surprising still that in 2022 uh, we're still creating buildings that are kind of uh, uh, effectively problems that we're going to have to fix. When, when I talk about this, I like to think about what 2050 ready kind of means, right? So if we were to think of instead of a, the unsustainable building, what should it look like? What could it look like? It does get very complicated, right? There are a lot of things to kind of consider. What you want to do is kind of address each of those items on the screen one at a time. If you wanted to sort of simplify it down, the two kind of most significant things is that every building, including existing and new buildings, will need to basically have, at least have, their energy use overall, right? Through combinations of whatever it takes, uh, insulation, air leakage improvements, controls improvements, uh, switching to a more efficient heating source like a heat pump, some combination of measures that reduce the uh, heat loss by at least half, hopefully a whole lot more. Uh, and then completely eliminating all fossil fuel use from buildings, all kind of gas boilers. Um, that's what you kind of need to do. Now, if I were to kind of sum up my sort of personal wish list for, for, for a process like this, because like I, I spent a lot of time thinking about this, and I think there, as I say, there's tremendous potential for a process like what you're doing with this jury to, to, to impact decisions going forward. I would encourage you, whatever you kind of walk away with, make it something we can start now because there's a temptation with a lot of this stuff to think that we're waiting on price reductions for certain technologies, or we're waiting on new innovations that don't exist yet. And that's really not the case. There are plenty of things out there right now that are cost-effective now that we can crack on with. We don't need to wait for 2030, right? Um, 
make gas boilers a last resort, not the default. Right now, they still very much are the default. They are about to be kind of eliminated from new builds in a few years, in 2025, but that's far too long. We've got three years to go. We've got to start getting rid of them sooner. Um, new builds. I'm going to give a couple comments here on new builds, which are a separate group from existing. Um, almost all the buildings that we're going to have in 2050 are already here. Right? So new builds, if we did everything perfectly right for new builds, we would solve 10% of the problem that we have in front of us, right? But that said, it's an important 10% to get right. And the first thing is to avoid demolition and, and, and rebuild. We do need to have new buildings, but we don't want to be destroying old buildings to do it. There's so much embodied carbon in, in existing buildings. It's kind of funny and it's tricky because the council will have a lot of pressure, a lot more pressure to build new things than they will to fix old things. And that's a really tricky challenge. From a carbon point of view, we have to be fixing and reusing the old things. Um, and then this one, I'm amazed this kind of needs to be said out loud these days, but it's really, really, really does that we need to be only making new builds that don't need retrofit again before 2050. Uh, existing buildings, which is 90% of the problem, we'll start with a slightly easier one. I would, I would love it if any project controlled from council purse strings was, was driven with net zero in mind, like a whole life carbon net zero approach. Um, as I said, retrofit is the big problem. And the biggest part of that problem is that there are very few drivers to sort of force retrofit to happen. So the council uh, could, could, could try to find more levers at their disposal to sort of encourage retrofit through planning and everything. Um, finally, using retrofit as a, as, as, a, as a tool to invest in local jobs and skills, which I think some of the other speakers are gonna discuss. And this last one I put here is, is maybe the trickiest one, and I don't have a clean answer for this, but this is going to cost money. I was involved in a project recently where the council had to unfortunately walk away from all the clean options because they couldn't justify the sort of downstream cost increase for a lot of the more vulnerable um, people in their constituency. And that's a real trick. There's no easy answer to that. This is going to cost money, uh, and it will unfortunately affect the, the, the most vulnerable and we need councils to be very proactive in how we approach that so we don't sacrifice uh, carbon savings for, 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 for um, along the way. Um, I will leave that there. I think I've used my time there and uh, I'll, I'll be around later for questions and I'm very happy to answer any details. I tried to leave all the numbers out of this talk, but there are lots of numbers behind all this if anyone wants to follow up.